Hello, hello. Uh, welcome to our panel discussion about the uh, business side of data science. Very important topic. Um, just to kick off before I introduce our panelists, I just want to say that it's exactly almost a decade ago, on October 2012, that the uh, Harvard Business Review declared data scientists as the sexiest job of the 21st century. <laughs> And I think after that, uh, this, this caught attention of, of a lot of people. And, and for the next couple of years, a lot of people were just transitioning into the field just because of the promise of machine learning and, and like the general artificial intelligence. And, and, and then this gave birth to the, to the onset of platforms <clears throat> like Kaggle. But I think it's only recently that we're starting to see people openly discussing the, the kind of real life challenges of actually translating those shiny concepts into, into proper business value. And as it turns out, it's not that easy, is it? So um, <laughs> today with me, I have uh, three great panelists with different backgrounds and different uh, ex exposures to, to, the, to the subject. Just So please allow me to, to introduce them now. So we have uh, Sonal Goyal. Uh, she's the founder of Zing.ai which is an open source uh, entity resolution tool, uh, which can link and deduplicate entity to give you a single source of truth. And uh, Sonal, you'll have a dedicated presentation on the topic tomorrow. So I encourage everyone to, to, to jump, jump on the session. Prior to working at Zinc, Sonal ran a boutique data science and the data engineering consulting firm. Um, she's also a repeat speaker and program committee member at conferences like Strata, Spark Summit or Datacon LA. When she's not resolving entities, she likes to read and spend time with trees and plants and also relax when, with family and friends. Sono, uh, welcome to the panel. Pleasure um, being here. Also with us, we have Brian T. O'Neill, um, a designer, founder and principal at designingforanalytics.com. Uh, which is an independent consultancy uh, helping technology leaders turn the data into valuable data products. So through Brian's UX consulting, uh, speaking and designing training, he's helped launch several enterprises um, and work closely with big names like Dell EMC, TripAdvisor, Fidelity, and so on. Uh, Brian is also a host of Experiencing Data podcast. And he advises uh, for MIT Sandbox uh, Innovation Fund. In the free time, he's a professional percussionist, and he played with The Who and Donna Summer. Uh, Brian, this is, this is amazing. Uh, welcome. Thank you. Yeah, it's good to be here. And uh, last but not least, we have uh, Justina Sabian, and she's the head of data science and AI and Telia, at Telia Lithuania. Uh, Justina has more than 10 years of experience uh, working with internal and external clients uh, to drive business value from data and analytics. And it turns out Justina is obsessed with data, not only while working, but also outside of work. Uh, recently, recently, she calculated the price per cubic meter of drawers and used this to choose which IKEA chest of drawers to buy to maximize space per euro. That's, that's, that's brilliant. I think I'm going to ask you for that algorithm, to be honest. Uh, Justina, welcome. Welcome to the, to the panel as well. So uh, ju just to kick off, I want to provide some statistics because it turns out that it's actually not the technology that is typically the problem in, in introducing uh, data in organizations. In, in, in the recent uh, survey by New Vantage Partners, 92% 92, uh, 92 of responders said it is actually the organizational culture that's the biggest obstacle. And only 8% said it is technology. 20% um, responders said they were successful in establishing a data culture. And only one in four the, uh, AI initiatives ever make it to production. So these are pretty, pretty, pretty interesting uh, statistics. And I just want to open the floor and ask you guys, uh, what do you make out of these numbers? How do they align with your with your prior experience at work? And and maybe let's just follow the uh, um, you know the order as I introduce you. So so Sonal, why don't you kick off? Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you for this. So uh, broadly, what I see while 
interacting with people is that the data discipline, uh, we, we, we definitely talk about the modern data stack and all the infrastructure being in place and, you know, just being able to spin on uh, machines and ready with uh, things. But as, as you uh, uh, rightly pointed out in the report, uh, it's, it's culture, but it's also that people are working towards different goals, right? So when you are the producer of the data, which is typically a product uh, engineer or a software engineer, uh, you don't have a complete view of how this data lands up in your warehouse or into your analytics practice or into your machine learning and data science pipelines. And then there is the consumer who is your data scientist or who's your data analyst who is grappling with this data and needs to figure out, you know, what are the columns, how do they align, what, what all data is at their disposal for them to use. And thirdly, there is also the business which probably wants some, you know, data centricity, but it's hard to define to what extent and to what, uh, you know, uh, what is it that would kind of, you know, lead them to feel that the data function is adding value to them. So I would say it's a combination of uh, those things, although I'm not sure really whether I agree with those numbers and whether it's, you know, uh, uh, dependent on the sample that they've taken, but definitely getting a proper data-centric organization or data practice in place is easier said than done, despite the proliferation of the tools. That's my take here. Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree about the numbers, especially the one in four AI initiatives making it to its production. To me, this seems like very high. Uh, I think in reality, we're talking about far, far, far lesser numbers, right? And and we're all laughing about this. Um, so, yeah, but uh, Brian, um, I'd like to hear your opinion about this. Yeah, I, I, so these surveys that are out there, the, the number one article on, on my website is an aggregate of all these surveys talking about how poor, how poorly the data and analytics community, whether it's machine learning or big data or BI or whatever you want to use, this kind of like 80% failure rate number has, has been out there in multiple studies. I just heard recently, and I think it was a Tom Davenport article, I, I forget which one, but, but there's actually some success here in terms of, especially in the enterprise with, with AI, some level of AI being deployed and actually producing some type of value. There's actually some real traction there happening now. Um, but I think the general sense that that getting, getting any value out of this, which I always tie to getting something used, you can't get the business value if you don't have people using the solution, which usually is some kind of digital interface or whatever, if you have low adoption or no adoption, you have no value. That is a general problem still. And I think especially the, the larger the organization goes, the more the issues are not just having all the technical stuff right. Like this, this idea that you can just simply have all the technical infrastructure, the data is clean, it's coming in the right volume, it's in the right structure, all the pipelines are there. If only we had that, it, everything would just be perfect. And it's like, nope. <laughs> no, it's not, you know. No. And this is why, to me, that this some of the other roles out there besides data science, particularly, for example, data product management are really important because there's a cross discipline thing that needs to happen. There's used change management, which I, I don't like this word. I don't like the word operationalizing it because it sounds like something that you do after you create your model, you then go and operationalize it. And a, a more to me, a, a more product and or design oriented way would be to think about how do we design the operationalization into the, the model or whatever we're building from the beginning? Like that, that is an inherent feature, if you want to call it, of this model, of the solution that we're making. The, the, the plan for deployment is in the design of the solution. It is not something that we do afterwards. So then the question is, well, whose job is it to do that? Is that where data scientists should be spending their time? And my answer is it's everybody's responsibility. And if there's no one owning it, that it's the team's responsibility. But that to me, leadership needs to set an expectation that our, our job is to produce outcomes and not to produce outputs. Like the, the model is not value, that the outcome from the model sits downstream from that. So the question is, are, are we playing the game to just produce things like models and, and dashboards and widgets and features and whatever applications and tools, or are we, are we challenged with producing value and outcomes downstream from that? What, which game are we playing here? And I, and I think a lot of teams are still playing the 
create outputs and things. And as long as we're checking in code and the model efficiency is going up and the data pipelines are cleaner, then we're winning the game. Like that's my job. It's someone else's job to make sure we get value from that. And I'm like, well, then whose job is it? Because the business is waiting for that. And a lot of times the IT and the technology teams and, and the big enterprises, and, and this is definitely more of an issue with non-digital company, non-digital native companies, right? Whose job is it to do that? Yeah. And, and that's an open question. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah absolutely. I, I recently listened to a podcast of, of Lex Friedman, where he spoke mm -hmm. with uh, Elon Musk, and he was saying that the actually the manufacturing bit is the stuff that is the most difficult part. And, and they, they think about how you would manufacture your, your, your product right from the beginning. And it's exactly what you said. We should be thinking about this from, from, from the day one. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, Justina, what, what are your thoughts about this, about these numbers and what we already talked um, about? I completely agree with what was mentioned here. And it resonates a lot with me, both, uh, both uh, what was said, um, why. So the let me go back to the use the main important the most important thing is when you start doing analytical project to start thinking about how it's going to be used and where it's intended so exactly is it the, will it be used by business by by internal external users and so on so that's one so that's the primary thing because that's the end objective whatever we do the insights the analysis it needs to change to do some kind of to make some kind of impact and it most likely will be done by person that means change management was mentioned here becomes very, very important. But before we go into change management, I liked what was mentioned um, here about um, different goals. What happens? We have different teams having different goals, usually they having different KPIs, and then the end objective gets lost in translation. So we see this working well and how it works. Of course, there are challenges. When you actually start thinking from the data beginning, at the very beginning, thinking about the customers or whatever you want to achieve in the end, the end objectives, trying to break down that one into smaller pieces and then putting together, not then, and then having a team which, which consists of people from data engineering, from the analytics, from data science and business side. So the ones who actually been there, used something, what didn't work for them or had some issues which they want to solve. So you bring them here. So, for example, um, uh, currently the Ventelia, we could be building a couple projects where we're actually attracting end users, so internal our colleagues who will be using the application, but we attract them to the project so that they can contribute the, the feedback, insights, and give already us some kind of suggestions. So then I think it works well. If you try to isolate one or the other part separately, it becomes very difficult because you have different objectives, KPIs. You are doing your thingy. You finish, I've done it. I ticked the box. One also working data is going, but does it actually do what it's intended? No. So I think um, I would say that. Yeah. I yes. think that uh, just to, can I add something to so, what Justina said? I, mean, I think the, um, the, sure. This idea of this I, I, idea of designing with our customers, and I'm going to use the word customer here to talk to, mm -hmm. or I could say users if you want to say users or stakeholders. Where's, we need to be designing these solutions with them and not for them. Mm -hmm, and exactly. the, the idea of collaboration is really important, partially not just so you don't stray and you don't have not just model drift, but project <laughs> drift, <laughs> but also because people, people, when they feel a sense of ownership in something are going to be more likely to use it when, when feedback is given, feedback is responded to, and along yeah. the way, they've been contributing to whatever this tool is, this dashboard, this this whatever the artifact is going to be that's coming out of it. When they have a some investment in it, they're more likely to champion that. And so this okay. is why shorter increments of work, regular participation together, designing with and not designing for, are probably going to increase your chances of whatever you're working on actually getting used. Mm -hmm. And then that chance of business value following on to that. <clears throat> Right. So those those are great points, and I actually wanted to add something, which is uh, about the surveys per se. Uh, so I think when we talk about the data function, I think just the expectations in the wider community, not just data professors mm -hmm. themselves, is like it's magic. It's automatically going to you know autopilot run your business. It will auto recommend everything. Uh, uh, you know, it will be just the click of a button, and you know we probably don't need more people. But if you look at adoption of uh, 
snowflake if you look at adoption of uh, data breaks if you look at the net promoter you know uh, uh, scores the satisfaction there uh, definitely there would have been a lot more churn and these companies would not have done that well if companies were not getting data centric so i think it's a journey and you can be you know we i think we are getting very ambitious also about what we expect when we want to be data centric and surely there is adoption in the market maybe the sentiment is not completely reflected to the level of expectations that we have but i think slowly and surely we'll get there mm -hmm. okay so uh, sticking to the to the uh, expectations management bit how do we how should we go about this as data professionals when talking to our kind of c c level executives to on the one hand have them interested in in the subject and the stuff that we can deliver you know like talk about our our future solution in in like beautiful terms but at the same time manage expectations so they don't go you know too crazy about oh so they will now give me this magic wand and it will be delivered in a in a month's time so so do you have any tips and tricks how to talk to the people that will be your sponsors and will be giving money for your for your project to to like keep, like have the appropriate space to deliver it and I, I just it's just an open question if anyone wants to chip in just please do I, I have tons of opinions on this, but I'm willing to let someone else go first if you want. <laughs> All right, well, I'll jump in. So, oh, go ahead, please. <laughs> yeah. yeah, sure. So I think, uh, see, my, uh, my basic philosophy every time I pick up any data work is to start small. To sm start small, have something which is measurable. Don't be an overhauling change with a, which, you know, needs a lot of, lot of integration across various data points have a small proof of concept which can quickly deliver value and then expand on data sets or on departments depending on what the use case is i think that's something that i've kind of always felt uh, is an easy sell is uh, managing the right expectations and also helps to keep my own nerves uh, cool <laughs> while delivering <laughs> brian about you I uh, completely agree with this. I would also add um, that it's quite important not to, I think we've done, how do you say it, um, we done very bad thing for the, ourselves as data scientists or statisticians, uh, mystifying uh, or putting a lot of mystery around what we do. But actually, when we start talking practically what it means, how the things are going and start explaining maybe a little bit in very um, measure, not measurable, uh, tangible things, what do we do and what it actually means, then it helps people or senior, senior management to understand that it's not some magic mystery which happens poof and it's done that it actually requires certain jobs to be done in order to deliver the projects um yeah yeah i i would add that the i i think you made some good points there about the demystifying thing and maybe the the marketing hype has probably contributed to this right mm -hmm. this this ai everything kind of culture and so a lot of executives it's just this fear of this fomo right like if we don't do it too someone's going to kick our butt in the market so we need to have ai so that goes into a a request for a project we want to use ai to do x whether or not that's the right hammer to bring to the job or not and so i think it's the responsibility of of data leaders to unpack these conversations that that is a cry for help and so deep listening and deep empathy for the person that's asking for that to unpack the unarticulated needs that are behind mm -hmm. that. Because there's usually something there, but it's these, these, are, these are rarely ever in a requirements document or written down in a neat sentence. They're just not there. And so I think a lot of teams are, are responding to the presenting problem or, or the mandate or the order, and they're not doing the requisite discovery work and research, we would call this research in the UX world, but really it comes down to deep listening and understanding why someone wants this thing that they think that they want. We want machine learning to improve our sales in the next two quarters, right? Maybe you need machine learning. Well, how much do you want to improve sales? What's wrong with sales now? How do you sell right now? What's it like to be the VP of sales? Like understanding all of this stuff is really important so that you can 
you're, you're by asking these questions, you're giving a gift. You, you are you are helping them unpack what's in their head that's not articulated so you can get alignment together. And eventually, if you do this work, you will get to the unarticulated need will be surfaced. And then we can start having a productive conversation, which is like, oh, so the real challenge is the salespeople don't know who to call. There's too many people in the CRM. They don't know who to call. They're spending a lot of time making bad phone calls. Is that what we're trying to do? Yes. Oh, I hate this. I spend eight hours a day, like six hours of my day are calling wrong people. Okay. Now that we know that, like maybe next in, in, in one, maybe in two weeks, we can just give you, what if we just give you a list of a hundred prospects to start with? It's just going to be an, a CSV export of a hundred people that your team can work on calling. Over the next quarter, we're going to work on a dynamic solution that will update in real time based on CRM information. And it won't, it won't tell you why it recommended it, but it will be a start. And then the next version, it's going to start telling you why it recommended these things. Would that be helpful? And how much lift are we looking for? And, and what's it, what are your fears about a system that's telling you who to call? If you're a salesperson and you don't know how it knew to call those people, where is this going to go wrong? How do we make this useful for you? It's unpacking those conversations and getting away from the we need machine learning to change our sales process because that might not be the right hammer to bring to the job. And, and this audience knows what the right hammers are, but they, they don't. And so by focusing on that downstream outcome and not the thing that they, the method, the tactic, the, the, the technology piece and, and getting back to the business part or the user need and that, what I, that cry for help, which is what it is, that's how we get this alignment there. And over time, you build that trust because if you can hit a home run with starting with this X CSV export down to this mm -hmm. dynamic tool that's in the CRM or whatever, now you're going to have credibility when you're like, hey, my team came up with this idea to do X. You're going to have that trust built in that like, I don't know what Pavel's talking about over there. It sounds good. And and I'm willing to give him some some fishing line to play with. Like, go ahead and take that line out into the ocean as far as you want, because I know you you get me. You get the team. You understand what we're trying to do with the business here. You've built that credibility. <clears throat> cool. Good. Yeah. So, so that, that's anyone wanted to add something? Um, mm, no. Oh, no. Yes. What do you think, Pavel? I'm yes. curious. No. <laughs> no, it is. It is. Uh, I absolutely agree. And uh, uh, what what I have in my head is the things that we describe are, are, I think, easy in the context of data native companies. They understand data. They know what data can give them. But what about a lot of these companies, like let's call them legacy companies, companies that treat data as just byproduct, like we never cared about the data. And, and a lot of people in these organizations, and it's not their fault, they just don't know what the data can give them. But the side effect is they, they kind of downplay the importance of the data. And sometimes it's difficult for teams like data teams, data functions, to get the attention of these people and, and, and say to them, hey, this is what I can give you, like, you know, um so so the question would be have you folks have been in, in a position like this where you really had to to struggle to like you know use the force to open the door and and convince the people to to start like looking towards data as, as an asset and not just a byproduct <clears throat> yes a couple of times basically when you need to start building because uh, as you mentioned not all the companies uh not all the companies uh, sell data not sell or make money out of data and data is by product so usually they care about their customers about their products how the best to advertise them and all those things and they come uh, what brian was talking before they usually would come with some kind or they would have real life problem which they are struggling them uh, too many customers maybe they were they don't know where to to to, to show their ad, for example, which media works the best. So then you want what you want to avoid going saying that you will do some something, some magic, which will uh, solve their problems. That's initially it worked, but later on uh, people started being a bit more skeptical because then you talk something what they don't understand and the result which they get, they don't understand again. So then how you want to approach this, you start working uh, most likely live them together being by the side maybe drawing a couple of dashboard couple of lines trying to understand and show how their how the business works checking with them do they agree what we see in the data or not 
and then pointing out maybe some um, what usually again happens, you start drawing the charts, you start talking about the data which they use or produce day on daily basis, start responding to their questions and pointing a couple of bits within the data sets where you see that it doesn't make sense and asking, have you known, have you know, did you know about this feature of, about the customers, what we see in this? Have you seen this? And they start thinking, and at the end of the day, they might realize, oh, really? Yes, we're missing this segment. The something is not right here. We should add maybe new, uh, new campaign. We should start thinking about new set of customers or maybe new type of product which doesn't address this market. So that's how we've seen again work, make this work and gain trust when you start working not being. Um, uh, how to say, working as a supplier for the business side, but more working along them to understand their problems and having uh, business people almost working the view together on a regular basis to, 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 to solve one of those problems. So then you build the trust and then it moves forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so those are, I think, uh, excellent points by Estina, which is, uh, you know, collaborate in a way which is non-confrontational <clears throat> Validate your approach, and I think she's made, she made I think the, the whole case very clear. I don't need to repeat uh, what she said. Uh, very well art articulated. Right. Okay, so I guess just put the uh, put put the customer in the middle and, and try to show them what you will gain from this, how I will help you, um, and 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 by this by, like buy trust and, and gain trust and, and and move forward with these little like small wins along along the way. Can I just add, Pavel? Mm -hmm. I think Brian? I think there's yes, like absolutely like, and, and this is not just for the data science community. I don't I don't want people to to take this wrong because our, our our identities get wrapped up in our job sometimes. But a lot of a lot of people in your organization, in a company like that, they probably just don't care that much about analytics and data science. They just don't. So the question is, what do they care about, and how could we help them? Because users and business sponsors are self-interested. So again, we talked about this, this kind of sales example, salespeople care about sales, salespeople care about landing sales. So instead of talking about analytics or how data and data this mm -hmm. and data that and, and technology and all this stuff, talk about how can I help you have more productive sales calls and, 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 and reducing the amount of talk about the technology piece. Yes, at some point, the technology will creep up and we have to get into that. But I think doing, getting to know our, our business sponsors, our users, our customers, all three, sometimes they're the same person. We need to be spending time not just making stuff, but doing research with them, which means observing how what it's like to do their job, like having some idea about the domain. If you're the CMO and you're running campaigns, like. What are you worried about? Well, they're worried about wasting money buying the right advertisements and they only mm -hmm. have so much budget. And my my job is tied to not wasting money. If you can help somebody feel confident that their job is not on the line or even better, I get a bonus if my ad rates are converting at whatever. It's like, help them with that. And I can guarantee you they'll care a lot more about data when you're talking about it as it help, as it will selfishly help them, which usually has something to do with actually helping the customer, right? Because mm -hmm. if you if you help with the customer, then the, the employee is probably going to benefit from that as well. So these conversations need to change to be focused on again those downstream outcomes. But we have to know these people. We have to be listening to them. We need to learn the domain, the the knowledge of the business of their space somewhat. And this this takes time. And if you're if a hundred percent of the team's time is just spent making stuff all the time. And, re and being re uh, playing the reactive game where you wait for the JIRA ticket to come in, the project request, the email, everything's on fire, everything's urgent. All you do is make stuff all day long. You're never going to get ahead of this because you're not forming the relationships. You're not learning why. You're just back to the, we don't have time to explain it. Just we need it now. Don't ask any questions. And so, great. Here's that dashboard with 52 columns of data. And I have no idea what these columns even mean or why someone would want them but I was told to give it to them. This is a leadership problem that needs to, to, to stop that. If you really want to get ahead, you've got to get out of that. And, and there will be times when it's just, yes, just give me this. It's not worth a conversation. There will always be time that, that those projects are legitimate. But if you want to be strategic here, you're playing a reactive game. And, <laughs> and to me, that's not going to work long-term. All right. <clears throat> okay. 
what I'm hearing a lot, Justina, I wanted to add something. Yeah, so actually I'm seeing the question. Um, uh, From Monica. Okay. Yeah. Yes, yes, about so, the so, so, so I think let, it's... Mm -hmm. Let me maybe read out the, the, the question. So, so the question sure. is about uh, proof of concepts and, and the threats related to it. So the question is, after all the pr proof of concept work, um, how do we get uh, away from the dangers of the of the POC being like put on the shelf and like all, all the work going to to waste and and not really being put on the production itself? At least this is how I understood the question. Mm -hmm. um, so so please go ahead. Yes, I thought that it's a very relevant question what we've been talking here and what was Brian uh, mentioning about motivation and uh, motivation why analytical projects are needed. So not because of the analysis and so on, but how it helps uh, different stakeholders or people to do something better. So then coming back to the POC. So let's assume we've done POC. There is a little bit technical depth in, in that. Question is then, once it done it, can we measure the impact it does on the KPIs? Not our KPIs, but stakeholders, so the ones with whom we want to help. Let's say, did it improve sales? Did it do something? Did it do something good? And then, and then, question is, do we want to move that POC post POC stage, or is it not worth moving it forward? And that's what probably we want to focus. We want to understand: can we measure the impact of what we've done, and if it's worth then. Uh, removing technical depth, if it's worth to improving it, because we see already a little bit value, let's say we increase sales by 5%, so then the, um, the hunger comes in from our stakeholders, because if they see it works, okay, it helped us, so now let's do, what do we need to do that the sales would go by 10%? And then you say, hold on a minute, I need a bit of time to improve here and there, and then I will do that and that. If you wait one more month or two more months, I will fix it, and then you will get your 10%. That's how I would suggest, because not all of the POCs worth to go into uh, or eliminating technical debt. Maybe it's good enough. Maybe the project was not good enough, and you, you just want to stop it and move your focus somewhere else, and that's completely fine. So not all of the technical debts needs to be fixed. And the ones which needs to be fixed, you can, how do you choose? If you see that it's important for the stakeholders, it's important for the business, and then for sure you will get your time, your money, and, and budget to, to kind of make it big and work. So that's how, how I see this. And it's also maybe the last one, just in this, it's worth to have your kind of vision, I would say, how you want to do things in terms of the data science and so on, what toolkit you want to do, best practices and things like that. So once you get spare minute here and there, or a bit of time, you can navigate your project in that direction. So it also helps to get, get that long-term view, what you want to do. You do a bit short term, you do a bit of workarounds, but at the end of the day, when you get free time, and you know that it's the, the project is worthwhile improving, you 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 make it um, a little bit better. So that's how I would say. <coughs> so just, yeah, I would like to add to that. Uh, excellent points again. Uh, but I think like when we talk about technical debt and, you know, stakeholder value, I think it's important to design for production but implement for the POC. So having that clear view on, you know, what, what are the key pieces, what are the design decisions you can make right away so that the effort to put it into production. So have an eye, having an eye to that is, is great. And then doing, implementing only what is needed for the POC to quickly convince your stakeholders becomes very, very important. So the alignment that we talked about earlier, where the stakeholders see value in the KPIs, and then they are ready to, you know, add to the budget, and then you can quickly turn around. I think those remain the key things as, as per my experience. <clears throat> I might just yep. add something that the, the pre-deciding -de pre what success looks like, right? Success shouldn't be determined at the end of the project. If it if it is, then it should just be against whatever the criteria was, right? We don't decide what the success criteria is after we launch. So if it's a POC, there might be both a, if it's really a POC, it's like, well, here's what the possible value is and here's what the risk is. Are we okay with this? And that's a conversation that happens before we go live and we take some of the emotion out of it and we collectively decide, we collectively come to an agreement with the people that we're trying to serve with the work. 
And most of the time, guess what? They're not going to know what a reasonable success. They're not going to know like eight, is it 8.2% or is it 9.4%? They're not going to have that answer right here because they haven't had to put a stake in the ground about it. This is a place where I think data people can actually help. And, and sometimes we do have to do a project, which is we have no idea if we're going to get any lift at all. So let's do that smallest amount of work to create an initial benchmark, which means the smallest possible thing. And once we find out what that our benchmark is, then we can have a discussion. Is it worth putting in X dollars in time to get our goal, which is a you know 12% lift or whatever the thing is, right? But the point is we have that discussion before we do the work so that we can then keep everyone on the same page and then have a check-in after it goes live to decide if it's further investment worth it. And by the way, let's talk about those risks that we talked about at the beginning that shouldn't be a surprise coming in at the end. So uh, to me, it's a setting expectation. It's just basic expectation management and having a, a clear idea about what, what does it mean to do a good job on this project? How do we know if we did something positive or not or fail? What, just mm -hmm. there should be yeah. some scorekeeping method. What is the, what game are we playing? Right. <clears throat> I, th I think it is it is very very important in our in our field to, to 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 be able to allow yourself to fail fast, right? To evaluate a hypothesis and just fail fast. But mm -hmm. but it's good when we make the decision and not 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 the business people tell us to to fail fast because then it's 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 the it's the wrong way around, mm -hmm. right? And I think the question was was just about this. Um, but I wanted to come back to 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 my previous observations because I'm hearing a lot about. We need to discuss, we need to go out there to the business, we need to talk, we need to collaborate. I think um, this is important. Uh, this is, um, it might be difficult in our field because for, from my observations, data scientists and, and people working in the data field are typically like introverts. They just, you know, they want to get the data, just, you know, this uh, pie charm, some algorithms, boom, headphones on, off, you know, he's, he's, he's away. So I just wanted to ask you about, uh, apart from the technical skills of data scientists, what are the additional maybe kind of soft skills or, or other, other um, yeah, abilities that make a good scientist um, it, still in the perspective of delivering good business results? I love this question. <laughs> I've been talking about this for students, uh, also the, within the company and so on. Uh, first of all, what I, yes, data scientists are usually introverts. Math people, the one who do programming, usually introvert, not all of them, but some of them, they tend to be a bit more. And I remember at the very beginning of this trend, they were saying, oh, you need to do everything. You need to do, uh, you need to be technical enough. You need to do project management. You need to be, you need to have soft skills, communication, all those. So you're kind of unicorn, you need to, uh, all of it. Nowadays, what I more like to think that you create teams uh, of uh, uh, of product teams, which then actually within the team you have mix of capabilities, which allows you then to deliver these projects. Now, what are the soft um, soft side of those capabilities? What are those? So I think first of all is curiosity. That one applies for the technical person, non-technical person, because the field is developing quite quickly, first of all. So you need to curiously kind of try to understand what you don't understand and learn about it. Also, the data, when you are in this field, it's always a lot of unknowns. You never know the right answer. So when you see the trend, you don't know. Are you seeing it correctly? Is there some issues in the day? So you need continuously question yourself talk with others kind of and see if it works, um, if that's correct. So that's one. Then stakeholder management, communication, telling the story, what we talked here about, how you connect all the dots. Again, you have data, you have customer, how do you connect those dots and try to, to work out to explain how things are working um, to non-technical people. Uh, design thinking that was mentioned a couple of times. So again, it's quite useful when you have someone in the team who has visual skills so they can map out the process kind of uh, split it down into smaller chunks because then it helps everyone to see, okay, what are contributing parts where I can, when I see the things on the paper, where can I contribute where I don't know and maybe I need to ask something about. So that's one is useful. What else? I think, yeah, that, that's kind of the core skill set and proactivity. I think that that's one also then you kind of want to a bit push yourself forward and 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 look into be curious and learn. But as I mentioned, 
what I see that it's quite difficult to find this in one person. So you try to have a, a mix, a team of couple who has each of them have individual skill set and then can contribute collaboratively to, to, to the development. I, I would add, so I would like to hear, Gunal, do you have a comment on this? I'd be curious. <clears throat> Yeah, so uh, uh, kind I kind of think, agree with. Yeah. Sure. No, no, Brian, please, please go, go ahead. Oh, okay. sure. We have. Uh, Brian, please the, go ahead. Yeah, it's okay. Please. We are lagging a little bit, uh, so um, Sonal, if, if you wanna, if you wanna, if you wanna, if you wanna jump in. Yeah, so uh, I I think most of the points uh, Stina has already made. I I would like to add one more thing. Uh, I th I think it's also the ability to kind of you know uh, sit back and not over optimize, uh, because as data scientists and data analysts, we tend to really you know get to that. Uh, F value, and uh, we want to really maximize the output of the algorithms. Uh, but at, maybe at some base level, uh, some of the things are okay to go by and present, and then you know get uh, the stakeholder more involved and excited about what we are doing. So that's just something I wanted to add there. Brian, over to you. Sure. Yeah. I, I think there's a, a fair number of skills to either develop here or to go and find in a different um, a different person if necessary. So this is very much the realm of product management. And this is why I think this, this data product management function is very important. It's, it's a generalist skill. It's a wide skill that's a lot about um, dealing with IT, dealing with the business, dealing with the engineers, dealing with the data scientists. How do I get all this alignment here? Because it takes it takes more than just getting the model right or the dashboard right or the engineering right or the pipelines right in order to get those downstream outcomes that we want. So I, I, I've i heard this thing that like, oh, typically introverted and kind of quiet. They just want to be left alone and all that. Like, I get that. There, there's actually the creative class is the same way. A, a lot of designers are like this as well. But here, one of the things I teach in my seminar about this is that one of the great things that doing learning to, to use research as a way to get into the heads of what stakeholders need and they want is that most of that is about asking a question and then closing your mouth mm -hmm. and using this. It's just listening. A lot of it's not talking. It's, it's being a deep empathetic listener and at, just learning how to ask great questions here. So I think understanding the skills of product management would be one thing. I think learning the skills of selling and most people, when they think selling, they think of an aggressive car dealership or some annoying salesperson. And if you if you really look at like deep consultative selling, it's it's really about figuring out how do I help this person improve their future, not by trying to convince them something, but helping them arrive at a decision that's good for them. I think we we are selling all the time in our life, and we don't realize that we're doing it. But but we're we're literally talking about like how do we like you know, convince the business AI is important, but not overshoot it and all this kind of stuff. We're literally trying to sell the value of data to the business. So go learn about selling, even though you're not going to get a check handed to you for, for convincing somebody of something, you do get a paycheck, but, but you're, you're actively doing selling. So, so consciously learning yeah. about how to do research, how to do sales, these skills are, are going to be helpful to you. Uh, and they're not for everyone. And some people yeah. aren't going to want to do it, but but you don't need permission to lead. You might need it to be a manager, but you don't need permission to lead and start asking these questions. And if you get tired of working on projects that don't go live mm -hmm. or they don't create value or they're like, that's not what I meant or this is too confusing or whatever. At some point, to me, it's much more fun. It's much more fun to produce work that's going to get used. And yeah. so part of this is a self I think we have to. You know. Thank you, Brian. I think we yeah. have to stop here. We, we just run out of time, but it's it's been it's been well forty five minutes already. Wow, really great panel. Thank you very much. I think the main takeaways: manage expectations. The second one: talk, talk, talk. 
And the third one, look for diverse teams, and this will maximize the chances of, of, of the business success. Thank you very much, everyone. And, you know, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Okay.